Welcome to Lancefield on the Line. My name is David Lancefield and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Amy Gallo, the author of the HBR Guide to Dealing with Conflict, a contributing editor at Harvard Business Review, where you, work, you write about workplace dynamics and many other fascinating things. And you're the co-host of the very successful and very enjoyable Wound at Work podcast. You're a coach, a keynote speaker, and, and a wonderful person. And you are working on a book at the moment, which we'll get to see in 2022, which is called Getting Along, How to Work with Anyone, Even Difficult People, written for me, clearly. Um, today, you're coming in from Providence, Rhode Island in the US, and you are really, really welcome, Amy. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, David. I'm excited yeah. to chat with you. Good. I mean, you're an expert on conflict. I'm sort of hoping and not hoping we, we have conflict today because I sort of think we've got to get it real. But let's see how the conversation goes. But I'm, <laughs> I'm curious, we've been living through a, what may be politely called a big experiment over the last year or so. And I'm curious about how your thinking um, on conflict has evolved during these difficult times. Yeah, I mean, it's, whew, it has been difficult times and there's multiple layers to this grand experiment, great experiment, as you, as you call it. I mean, I think if we think about simply working virtually, right, mm. that has added a whole different layer of um, complication to the way we interact with our coworkers, to how we handle conflict, whether conflicts come up, how we get along with our coworkers. Yes. You know, and, and it's, it's two-sided, I think. On the one hand, the, being in a virtual environment, uh, you know, not seeing our coworkers every day, even and and being in going through intense times together, you know, everyone yes. has had been touched by what's happening in the world, um, both with the virus, but also you know with the reckoning around racial justice. You know, so many people have been mm -hmm. touched. So we tend to give people the benefit of the doubt when we're not in the same room with them. Yeah. yeah. Um, Part, you know, partly because we don't see the eye roll, you know, <laughs> they can turn off camera, they can, they can complain to their partner at home about work, but you don't see that body language. So yes. we tend to be more focused on the task. Yeah. Now, that's a minor upside compared to the many downsides, at, which I'm sure I'm curious, actually, if you've experienced this, which is, this is a medium that is ripe for miscommunication, yes, and misunderstanding. And so what I've seen given the elevated stress levels that so many of us have combined with not really having real connection. I mean, even you and I, I feel like I'm looking in your eyes, but I'm, I'm missing so much context. I see mm. the wall, the bookcase, your shoulders, but I don't know if you're fidgeting with your foot. I don't know if there's another person in the room off camera, right? I'm missing all that yes. context. Yes. And that means that I'm layering uh, my own interpretation of your situation and you're nodding and you're all, everything you're doing, I'm making meaning out of that without a ton of information. Without the full picture. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's one of those things where I guess we're, la we're layering on assumptions, as you say. Um, and many of us, I'm guilty of this. Uh, we are, we've also defaulted to one medium of communication, which is whatever platform, Zoom or Teams or whatever platform it is. Yeah. Whereas, I used to work in a big organization where we've had this technology and used it um, regularly before the pandemic, but we, we actually were more skillful. We didn't use it all the time. So we yes. defaulted to this. And I, you asked me my, my own experience. We tend to get straight into the subject matter. Um, and then we, once it's done, it's like we're done. And hence any you know, allowance for breathing or expression, however much of your body you can see sort of gets, you know, I, I guess it gets removed from the from the equation, um, and then it takes, I guess, somebody pretty brave to actually reach out afterwards to say, you know what, my sense is that whatever I said didn't land. Yeah. So what what could you? I mean, given virtual working is here to mm -hmm. stay for many organisations, or is already a default for many organisations. They've grown up virtual, but yeah. hybrid is going to be more prevalent in many organizations yeah. what, what can we do do you think to sort of get over some of these barriers yeah well one thing that i've seen work really well is to over communicate right so um that might mean you know make sure you do the small talk that we used to do as people were gathering in, oh. in a meeting room right chat how, how what's the weather like in you know the uk today what please don't ask no. about that <laughs> that's actually <laughs> right I can tell from your sweater just exactly <laughs> that it's not, it's not yet summer. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but the, but, you know, 
talking about how's your family doing, you know, just even as simple as, you know, I've seen this happen in, in larger meetings where in the chat, you know, on a scale of one to 10, what's your mood today, right? Just, right. just checking. You have to with- manufacture it in a way a little bit more than you would otherwise. Exactly. The, right. the other piece of it is you have to intentionally communicate about your intention. So again, mm-hmm. because we're layering on this meaning, right? I heard this really great story of someone who was looking at a clock on the top, like sort of the top left of her screen um, during a meeting and everyone in the meeting thought she was rolling her eyes the entire time. Oh, well, yeah, right. And so, right. So, and literally, when someone actually, you know, it took weeks when someone finally said, why were you so mad in that meeting? You were so disrespectful. She said, oh, I was just watching the clock because I had to pick up my kid, right? And I was worried about the time. And mm. so as soon as that was clear, like, so I, I think what we need to do, we, we need to explain our behavior. There's this concept in, yes. in social psychology fun. called naive realism. So we think right now, I think I'm being crystal clear. And hopefully I'm, you're Absolutely. understanding me. Absolutely. <laughs> hopefully your, your viewers are, understand what I'm saying. But to me, it's much more clear than it is to the other person. And so hmm. because we think our, our intention is how people are receiving it, this whole you know, debate around intention versus impact, which is, which is interesting. But we have to say, okay, my intention with, in, with this meeting is to raise some uncomfortable issues. Let's, let's, we might all feel a, a little unsure about it. Let's stick with it no matter what. Or but the framing is very important. The framing is very important. Exactly. And actually that has a real benefit in terms of genuine inclusion for people who yes. struggle to um, see, interpret and use cues that are prevalent in all aspects of life, especially the workplace. Actually, if somebody's more obvious about, you know, more intentional, actually that can be very powerful in terms of um, inclusion. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, talking about conflict, so you, you, know, you can encourage, you know, not necessarily conflict, but proper debate. Sure. Um, I mean, if I look back over the last 25 years in all the organizations I worked with, rather than just people associating with my old former employer, yeah. um, skillful conflict management, if you like, was pretty rare. Mm-hmm. I tend to think of extremes, which is either it goes very passive aggressive. So it's under this, you can sense it if you can sense it, or it's under the surface and you better not trigger it because there'll be a volcano. Or there is a full on conflict and then the parties don't <laughs> come together if ever again. So real polarization. Um, how, how typical is that? And what, what sort of exemplars have you seen that have actually manage conflicts effectively yeah so my experience is very similar to yours which is i see even you know even organizations that are intentionally trying to get good at this are not very good at it it is really hard to do um for a variety of reasons there's a term patrick lencioni who wrote the five dysfunctions of teams he has this term called artificial harmony which is what I see more often. So I see the passive aggressive, the, oh yeah, we all get along with, but then there's the back channel conversations. There's the rolling the eyes in the meeting, Mm -hmm. you know, there's new ideas aren't getting raised. I mean, that's, that is the biggest one is that when you think about innovation or an inclusive workplace, those are the two hits that organizations take the biggest when people don't speak up. Right. I do see some on the other side of the like all out brawls. I mean, I've certainly come in where, I said, oh, you know, what's going on with these two departments? Like, oh, the, you know, the heads of those departments haven't spoken for six months. Like, Mm. like, we just allowed this? Like, what are you, you know, so that does happen to me. That's more rare. More, more often it's this sort of politeness that, and, and people, because there's been such an emphasis on having a nice, polite culture, people have interpreted that as I'm not allowed to disagree. Yeah. Yeah. So that, I mean, organizations or individuals who've read your book, worked with you, and obviously become more skillful as a result, um, how much of an, if you like, uplift in their performance do they see? And where I come from that is I can understand it being an important enabler for a, ni- you know, as you say, nicer culture. Mm-hmm. But I'm curious about how much it actually drives and triggers greater overall performance in an organization in terms of handling yeah. conflicts well. Yeah. I mean, I think the real measurement, and you asked about exemplars, you know, there are definitely organizations that are 
better at this than than other organizations. And I think we can look to Amy Edmondson's research around psychological safety, mm. right? Mm. We know organizations where people feel they can speak up without retribution. They can admit their mistakes. They can, you know, talk about failure. They don't assign blame, but talk about growth. What did we mm. learn from the situation? We know from research that those organizations perform better. Yeah. And it makes sense. I mean, it's logical, right? That if people aren't afraid, they're not feeling shame or embarrassment, they will bring their best selves to work and they mm. will contribute ideas. I mean, I think the real piece of, you know, the innovation piece is so huge for organizations Yes. because if you default to a leader's perspective, the view on strategy and no one challenges, no one pokes holes, no one points out the risks. Mm. I mean, you've probably been in so many organizations as I have, where people are like, I think the strategy is sort of, you know, like that's not going to work. And well, there isn't seeing, one. There's not there is, <laughs> right. Well, because we can't even have the difficult conversations to come up with one. Right. Mm. Um, so I think that there's the downside is huge, but the upside in terms of what Linda Hill at Harvard business school calls creative friction is, mm. is, is also really um, important. And I, and Unfortunately, I think more rather than organizations that are great at this, I think I see more pockets of teams that right. are really good at it. So inside right. organization, I'll see a leader who's very clear, it's okay to disagree with me, who focuses, has a real growth mindset, is focused on learning over execution, all of that, all of that stuff that we know creates psychological safety. They've mm. done a wonderful job creating that on that team. And then you have sort of a microculture within the bigger culture where conflict is normalized, yes, uh, you know, and, and is healthy rather than destructive or unproductive. Yeah. I mean, I can see a, I can see a situation where you, you frame the conversation the way you described. And then the question is how that the individuals then right, interact with each other when it's happened. Yes. I've been in situations where the framing has been beautiful and everyone's felt relaxed, the shoulders come down, people then talk... But when one person takes on another saying, by the way, I'm not, however professionally they do it, I'm not sure that idea flies and so on. I've seen many situations where it gets deeply personal, you know, very quickly, however good the framing is. So how, how do you stay with the, stay with the conversation once yeah. you've done that framing? Yeah, it's, I had um, a, one of my clients, a, a biotech firm asked me to look at their, their employee engagement survey. Cause they were, cause they were really trying to figure out why aren't people speaking up? They're really, they have this huge push for innovation. Why aren't people mm. um, speaking up? And the, the survey data, you know, is broken down by leader and unit and, and the question around, do you feel safe disagreeing? I can't remember the exact wording, but that was essentially mm. the underlying, it was hor It was just horrible. And they said, can you help us? Because for the past three years, we have been beating the drum that we want to hear your ideas. There's yeah. no bad idea. Disagree, disagree. And yet no one does it. Right. And so, you know, what we started to look at is, okay, you're saying it, but are you acting it? Right. right. And I think right. the minute a leader, and you've probably been in meetings like this, the minute someone disagrees with the leader and the leader displays any minute body language that shows yeah. that's not okay, everything shuts down. Yeah, yeah, it becomes multiplied, doesn't it? I mean, it's yeah. usually multiplied, yeah. Yeah, well, and I even had, I think it was the same organization, although this has happened in, in several, where I'll ask someone, so why don't you speak up? You know, I'll have conversations with folks before I do go in to do work mm. to try to understand what the culture is. And they'll say, well, I just don't want to be fired. And I say, okay, well, who, you know, can you point to who's been fired for speaking up? And they said, oh, no, we never fire anyone here, right? So they have both the, <laughs> right. like, tolerance of underperformance and the deep fear that they're going to be fired. I'm like, this doesn't add up. Right. And they, when you point that out, they laugh, but they're like, yeah, but I still don't feel safe. And mm -hmm. I think it's a lot of these micro um, moments that leaders, they're saying one thing, we want ideas, disagree, push back. And yet when they, when it happens, they're really uncomfortable. Yeah. They're giving off a completely different message. Or, so Sorry, or I was going to say, or they say, let's take this offline. Like yeah, that is that's a classic, the, right? <laughs> and that's the big that there's no better way to squash disagreement than to say it's not comfortable to talk about in a group. We have to do it behind the scenes, and then they never follow up. So you don't know was that person rewarded? Was that person punished? Like, yes, you don't have any idea. And yet they might even talk about having more encouraging, more transparency in the organization, even though they they have the, the secret meeting, or actually the meeting, the the sort of plenary meeting becomes a 
sort of performance theatre. And so a lot said, it's choreographed beautifully, but actually the substance is, as I say, in the bilaterals or the offline meetings. Exactly, yeah. So I can see, I can see how you can encourage proper discourse, potentially sometimes conflict in meetings and moments, but there is conflict which sort of permeates teams and organisations that sort of not in the moment, but it may be about, for example, a lack of fairness about how, how somebody's treated or how performance is managed mm -hmm. and so on, which sort of is simmering under the surface and may explain some of the behaviours. Yeah. How, if you're a manager or a leader, do you try and deal with that underlying conflict that's not explicit in, in a particular situation? Yeah, I mean, I think... I think about this phrase, you want to make the unmentionable mentionable, right? So there, there might be that simmering conflict underneath. And then maybe it's about people are being dis are disgruntled that they're not getting their bonuses this year because of what's going on in the world, right? Mm -hmm. Or they um, might think that the person who got promoted to be the leader of the team was not the one who actually deserved it. Mm -hmm. Or maybe, and this is, I'm seeing this more and more, people are really concerned about the organization's approach um, to anti-racism efforts, yes. right? So, and so there's no, these conversations that don't get raised. And I think as a leader, you have to start to put words to that. Um, and you might say, you, you know, you can use, you might be artful and say, I was talking to another team leader, their team's really digging into this issue. Is that something people want to talk about on this team? And you may get a lot of quiet, right? And acknowledge that and then bring it up again, right? If, if you're pretty sure this is an issue for your team, you're going to have to say it multiple times yes. before people feel comfortable and give them many outlets, right? So the ideal, of course, is that we all feel comfortable having an open debate we can mm -hmm. share. That is a pipe dream in most Quite. places, right? Yeah. Um, and partly because we're hardwired for likability, right? Like when you're nodding and you're like, I feel, it feels great. Like I'm built to want encouragement. That's how we, that's how we <laughs> yes, survived, indeed. right? Yeah. So you, we're hardwired for that likability. So we have to really be clear that you can disagree in public. You can just like send me a private message. You can disagree in, you know, the chat, like we give people many, many outlets to express that disagreement and then reward the people who do, right? Yes. So, yeah, that's, what, yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Because if, if you think of us as, as uh, tribal species, like we are used to ostracizing people who don't care about the collective. Quite. And so it's very instinctive when someone disagrees, especially when someone's, you know, when the team's starting to coalesce around a decision and then there's that one person who's like, you know, I'm just not sure. It's like, oh, like, could you please just get on board, right? It, and then they question all the other aspects of them, which is not about their ability or contribution, but they're not loyal. They don't get it. They're a bit different. And in the moment, it may be laughed off. But if that continues, then actually that, you know, separation happens very, I mean, it's been very quickly. That's right. That's right. And what that's when I you notice? start. Yeah, that's when I'm you start to I... see. Oh, sorry. Sorry, go, go on, ahead. please. I was going to say that's when you start to see real issues with diversity in organizations too, Indeed. because we want people who are going to agree with us, people from different backgrounds, different perspectives, different races, genders are likely to have different opinions because of the, their different experiences. And the, the more we sort of tamp down the disagreement, the more those people will feel excluded, the more we all sort of navigate to the norm. And that's just mm -hmm. really dangerous. And you to do that, you in some ways, if you're the convener of a group in that way, you have to have a healthy degree of patience, I'd say, because if people will express their ideas, views, differences in lots of different ways. It's not it's not as though we all have the same way of communicating, and I mean verbally for the moment, but there's obviously other aspects of communication. It would be easier if we all had the same sort of like the, the three bullet point messages and we can contribute. But I've seen people who've had a well-meaning in trying to do the things you've described. But when somebody's perhaps a little bit long-winded or they, they start at the bottom of the issue and then work all the way up, which is not the house way of doing things, yeah. actually yeah. requires somebody who either is willing, can see the kernel of an idea or a point there, or just has a healthy degree of, you know, is, is centred themselves. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, we all carry these, like tiny or huge egos into the office, whether we're doing, whether this is the office or whether we're going to a building, right? And th those egos are very fragile for many of us. And so as a leader, 
patience exactly is what we need. Mm -hmm. And also we need a sort of a, an ego that's um, stable or secure because it does feel challenging. And, you know, if I, when a leader allows someone to go on and on in a meeting or does that bottom up, you know, mode of communication or they're, they're not just sitting there thinking, oh gosh, I wish she would get to the point. They're also thinking, do I allow this? How is this affecting the rest of the team? How does this make me look as a leader? Yes. Is this person challenging? Like there's so much going on. It does require so much centering of self and, yes. and sort of calm approach to, mm. you know, I, I do think one of the best things a leader can do is display comfort when something like that happens. So, you know, instead mm. of, cause everyone's watching you as the leader and interpreting like, is this okay? Is this okay? Is this okay? And so the more and actually you finding a language in some ways, finding a language where you can give an immediate reaction that is constructive without necessarily opining. Yes. And if I think back on some of the most impressive people I worked with and for, it wasn't fake, but it, I think actually they had some stock phrases that they developed, um, which wasn't just the usual, oh, that's a great point, or in the UK, that's interesting, which, by the way, can mean about a million different things. Normally, it's not interesting at all. Right. But they had a certain way of at least recognizing the point and mm -hmm. actually giving then somebody an opportunity to then contribute rather than labeling it or putting, giving it a strong opinion. I, mean, I remember doing some... Um, some work with Nancy Klein of, of Time to Think, mm. and as well as being centered and, and listening attentively and so on and not interrupting, as I just did a moment ago, forgive me. That's okay. One of the things she was very good at in the sessions she ran with us was she said she framed it again very skillfully where she said, look, what I'd encourage you to do is be kind to the listener. Mm. So, you know, that means relatively succinct. However you say it, relatively succinct. So I think fr framing can help. But let me, let me just move on to another, another topic that's prompted by what you were saying, Amy, is you know, this is a really important skill. Right? There's no question it's a really important skill, and we can see the benefits and downsides. Um, if I think about graduate or apprenticeship programs, and you think about the training people get in organizations, I'm generalizing and simplifying, it tends to be technical, right? mm. probably a little bit more about communication, but sort of outward communication. Um, have you seen organizations that actually embed what we've been discussing sort of ground up? Have they done, have you seen your example? Or, yeah. You know, I mean, I'm curious, I, where do you start? I mean, you have to start somewhere. Right. Yeah. Well, I think, and it's as with any change effort, as you're very familiar with David is like, it has to be bottom up and it has to be top down, right? Yes. You can't, you, you, you can have the leaders talk their ear off, you know, talk the, the staff's ear off about, we, we're going to be a culture of disagreement. We're going to have healthy debates, right? And if they don't play, then you've got nothing. Similarly, mm -hmm. if, you know, your staff says, I'm sick of being, being stifled. I want to, we want to speak our opinion. And they're just constantly getting dinged for doing that. Mm -hmm. You're not going to. So it, it's really about both sides. And that's where I see a leader who's committed to having open debate, to having an innovative um, you know, psychologically safe organization, along with a, you know, a staff population that is real, that has the skills. I, you know, I, I sometimes yes, yes. joke at the beginning of a workshop or a talk, I'll say like, okay, who's ready to learn how to fight? Right. Yeah. And <laughs> which always makes people a little uncomfortable, but I, for many people, it's the first time anyone has ever said, here's how you have a healthy debate. We don't learn that. And if you look to our models, usually our parents, um, you know, teachers who usually is, are not in working together, you just have one yes. of them. So you're not yes. seeing, seeing. And then of course, our political environment, right? The way that, that dissent and debate is just vilified or Indeed. intensified in our, in our political environment or in the media, we have no models. And so for oftentimes in my workshops or talks, it's the first time someone's really given the skills to actually handle these things. And so I do think it has to be, you know, both ends of the spectrum in terms of the hierarchy and it's a, it's a daily practice. It's not, mm -hmm. we do one thing. I say one, one announcement, yes. like you got to just keep doing it. And, and it's like, like any muscle, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I know you've been, you've been curious about 
you know, diff- you know, curious about and learning about difficult people. Yes. And, and, and in different contexts, in different ways. Yeah. And I'm curious about one particular type of person you're most interested in. Yeah. And, and as you describe that type of person, if you're in a situation where you do want to get over or encourage conflict, but get over certain issues and situations, how far does a leader go in trying to understand the root, if you like, the, some of the root causes of some of the behavior, as opposed to dealing with the, what are called the tactical mm-hmm. um, aspects of day-to-day behavior? So yeah. what were you most fascinated, are you most fascinated with? Yeah, I love this question because this is really what my next book is all about. And and what I saw with the first book about conflict is that people would come to talks or conferences where I was speaking and, and there was always someone afterward who would come up and say, I love what you said, but I have this one coworker. Right. Yeah. And they always and it's and there was all and they I heard the craziest stories from people about these coworkers who were really difficult. And that's why I wanted to write the next book was I was like, okay, how do you deal with these people who seem immune to all of the best practices, all right. of the tips, right? right. Um, and I do think your question about how much time should a leader spend trying to understand that person. So like, let's take one of the archetypes from, from the book is the pessimist, right? So mm. the person who just is really happy to point out that this is never going to work, right? That the many times we've tried this before, we don't have the capabilities, no yes. one's you know, the, you can, you've heard, you, you've heard it many, we call this the Debbie Downer in the US. I'm sure you all, do you use that term too? No, no, but I, I get it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, and there's actually a great Saturday Night Live skit. Um, Rachel Dratch plays Debbie Downer, which is very fun to watch. Just, right. she takes the air out of every room in like right. 30 seconds. We'll share that one. Yeah, we'll look, yeah. That, look at that one and share that one. Yeah. So, um, so how much do you have to understand the psychology of the pessimist you know, to deal with them is a great question. So on the one hand, you could spend all your days psychoanalyzing your coworkers, right? Oh, yes. you know, that one's in a bad marriage. That's why they are unpleasant all the time. That one had a really tough child. Like you could just, you could spend all your time doing that. Mm. It's not that useful to be quite honest. That yes. said, it is helpful to understand what, what are some reasons that someone might behave in a pessimistic right. way, not because it's going to help you like get them therapy or yeah, you're not there to solve their issue, the underlying no, issues. Yeah. No, but it will develop some empathy, right? right. So like you're, you, you know, your colleague's advice of like, be kind in every conversation or listen with kindness, right? That is what you're essentially trying to do. Yes. So someone who's a pessimist you know, Heidi Grant um, talks about this promotion versus prevention focus. So mm. promotion folks or people who have a promotion focus are really focused on opportunities and challenges sure. and right. And a prevention focus is like, how do I avoid the risk involved? Mm. And you want both people on the team, right? We mm. think we all want the promotion focus people, but you'll never get anything done if yes. someone's not pointing out the way things yes. Can, can yes. go wrong. So I think your effort to understand that person, especially the pessimist, is to understand, one, what are the upsides of this behavior? Because there are, even your most horrible coworker, there's probably some upside to what they're doing. And mm. finding that will change the dynamic quite I guess a bit. it's finding the situation and finding the moments where they can flourish. I mean, in quite a lot of the innovation and strategy work, having somebody who really gets into, for example, it's a different point, the, the detail, or is negative yes. about it can actually be really helpful in small doses. Yes. Not at the beginning when you're trying to do all the exploration, right. but when you're trying to get to more what I call structuring, actually it can yep. be very helpful, but you have to be careful and strategic about how you, where you deploy them. That's uh, right. That's right. Um, Cause the, what, what's your sense of the level of consciousness of people um, for the people you've either studied or interacted with, you know, so you've given a label to, you know, the Debbie Downers of the world mm-hmm. and there's others you, you've been exploring. How conscious do you think people are about their what they give off and the impact that they have? Um, very little. <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think, I think I, anyone who does, um, co- you know, executive coaching certainly knows the level of self-awareness is usually pretty low. I mean, yeah. people oftentimes, especially as a coach, when I, you know, present them with 360 feedback or, um, you know, we start digging into how they're perceived, they're very surprised. And 
you know, some of it might sound familiar, right? Like, oh, yeah. you know, um, like my partner tells me that, or yeah, I've, you know, my job, my last job, all my performance reviews mentioned that now that I think about it, but most of us are really unaware of how we mm-hmm. come off. And that again is partly because of the social, social psychology phenomenon that we're very focused on what we intend and we're less yes. focused on how yes. people are receiving us. So yes. I do think most people are very unaware of how they're being um, perceived. And it can be, this is incredibly hard to do, but to help someone in a kind, compassionate way understand how they're being perceived can often change that behavior quite a bit. It's very skillful to do that, isn't it? Because they have to be in the right mindset to listen, to frame it in the way that they would understand. It's remarkable in in sort of people-led organizations how little investment of time and attention is given to uh the dynamics between people yes in in the most mercenary organizations that are still run and led and managed and delivered by people albeit with obviously technology enabled of course yeah it's still considered a bit of a soft skill the sort of thing that hr is responsible for or you know you and and the sort of the trade-off between oh you, you can't you know if you're going to be commercially successful you don't do that sort of stuff. You don't need to do that stuff. Yeah. It needs to be brought together, right? Yeah. I mean, these are enablers of strong commercial performance. Yeah. Well, and if you think about, I mean, how many times have you heard the phrase, we're all adults here, right? Yeah, which, yeah, yeah. which is <laughs> and usually- then normally there's something really patronizing that comes <laughs> after that. <laughs> exactly. Well, and what they mean is like, oh, we, we, we are all evolved beings who don't need to do this soft stuff. Cause like, yeah. we're just, but it's just, I, I I got into, got really interested in conflict and difficult conversations as a as a consultant, which we we share that background. Mm, when I would be know. I would be in organizations, and I would say it doesn't matter what the strategy is. It doesn't matter. Like we can debate this all. What's interesting is the way we're talking about it and the way we're interacting, because that is going to make or break whatever strategy we That's come up. With. And of course, it matters what strategy is, you know, but. Yes. But what I was really fascinated with is how much the interpersonal dynamics shifted all of the decisions people were making. And sometimes people would make a decision because they just didn't want to debate this person any longer because he was such a bully about it. Or the leader was passive aggressive. And so, you know, we just are avoiding that topic or we're just going along with her because we don't want to trigger the negative behavior we've seen. So it was really dictating so many decisions being big, big decisions that were yes. being made. And I think if not paying attention to it, it it's, I mean, it, it is really dangerous and really counterproductive to all of the things we say we want to achieve as organizations and companies. Yeah. And it's one of my areas of real fascination and practice and research is around the, like the human dimensions of strategy, mm-hmm. um, as, as you're saying. How, yeah. how decisions are made, who's involved, what biases people bring. Because however good a process you run for developing strategy, however emergent it is and iterative it is, I find often that the people dimensions you describe are sort of separate, separate in both mindset and practice. And I think there's a real opportunity there. I mean, the one thing I wanted to move on to before we before we close is we talked about inclusion earlier. And obviously you, you're... you're you played a big role in you know, your podcast, you know, your women work, part, which is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, if I'm allowed to, I am allowed to. I listen to and enjoy. Good. Um, what's your barometer at the moment on, if you like, the spectrum of representation, mm-hmm. inclusion, and belonging when it comes to women at work? Where are yeah. we? Scale and what's your overall barometer? How do you feel? Um, gosh, you know. It's different every day, <laughs> to be honest. Like right. th- this, this um, for the podcast recently, we've been doing a series called The Essentials, where we are yeah. interviewing experts on essential career topics, along with a woman who's working in an essential job. So a social worker. Yes, yeah. We just yeah. had a farmer on the episode that that dropped yesterday, um, and honestly, that gives me hope because you know as we're I just feel like people are talking about these issues more. Um, we're really thinking about how do women succeed in a, in a system that we know is often rigged, rigged against them. Yes, They're, The conversation is, is gives me hope. And I think we have 
I mean, my mom just um, actually got an honorary degree from her alma mater because it was the 50th anniversary of women at her at her college. And I think about she, you know, she was one of three women. She crossed that platform with to get her diploma with an infant in her arms. You know, I just think about how much the world has changed in that 50 years. And I feel hopeful about that. And yet I see what the pandemic has done. I mean, we are at, at Mm. least in the US, we are at 1980s level workforce participation for women. And so I think we're gonna have a real representation issue if we, even if we just take representation as the- Yes, yeah, and that's the the beginning. Exactly. We are- we are in trouble. And in, unless things turn around in the next year, when people, when things start opening up and people get back to work, it, there's just going to be a dearth of female talent. And I think that's a real, it's a, it's a tragedy in the making. Um, and, and it's, so I, I'm cautiously hopeful. I think we're having a lot of the right conversations. Yes. Um, you know, I, I, I get asked to speak to women's groups a lot because of, um, because of the podcast and because of my, the work I do. And I keep saying, can you, someone ask me to speak to some men's groups, please? Because I really think men need to hear these messages. Yes, yes. I do, you know, I do worry we're talking a little bit. I love that you listen to the podcast. It makes yes. me so happy. I want more men to listen to it. Yes. Um, you know, and I want the consciousness, not just among women, but among everyone of all genders to be raised around why this is a challenge. I, I was just talking to the head of a women's group at a law firm. And she asked the question, fundamentally, we're asking now, you know, with this work is who's fixing whom, right? Right. Is, yes. Is, is yes, it the indeed. women? Is it the women fixing the organization yeah. or fixing yeah. men? Or is it the organization fixing women? And I, I think that that what question. Was the answer? <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's that we're fixing the organizations because I think that's right. ultimately where we're, you know, these, all the things we've been talking around, around conflict and healthy debate and inclusion you know, that's where the rubber meets the road for, you know, DEI, DIB, whatever I you agree. want to call it. I agree. I mean, one, of the things that, one of the things I wrote about with a, in an article recently in HBR with Gina Cox, um, which was on inclusion, but mostly about race, but I think the principles apply, which is yeah. you have to do all of it in, at the same time. It's not a case of one initiative or one leader. You sort of have to have a coherent set of actions. Yes. Because if people see or spot or sense gaps, um, it just falls apart and secondly frankly there's so much to do that we need yes. you know concerted action oh, and i um, have to say i loved that article david because i thought you and gina did a great job it also has to be systematic right it yeah. can't be. Yeah. and that's the thing you know we're coming up on the one year anniversary of the murder of george floyd and yes. it is um when we're recording this i don't know when it will be out but it, yeah. it it's um I think a lot of there's a lot of activity, but unless it's system systematized, unless it's coherent, unless it's constant, you are not going to make progress. And that was the argument you and Gina yeah. were making. I think it's well, you just- summarized it better and added your own flavor, which is as always <laughs> you do a brilliant job. Amy, we've covered a lot of ground. I, I love the topics you cover. You cover the the topics that I think are we know are, are there, but are often skated over, and you do it with skill, um, with you know real rigor. And you write and speak beautifully. Um, oh, I'm really grateful for your time today. Yeah. Where can people find out more about you and what you do and what you stand for? So um, best place is my website, which is amyegallo.com. You can sign up for my newsletter. You'll be, if you sign up for the newsletter, you'll be the first to hear about my new book when it comes out in 2022. Can't wait. Yeah. You can also find all my writing on uh, hbr.org. Just search my name. Um, David, before we wrap up, I do want to, because I just, because I want to do a meta discussion about the conflict piece, because there were many times you and I were interrupting, talking over, and that's part of it, right? Mm. It's not this, like, I think we expect, especially like we're in this sort of fabricated environment of an interview, right? We want it to go so smoothly, but the interruptions and the, and the cutting off each other off, that's part of it. It's part of the mess. Mm. And as long as we're both okay with it, and if I wasn't okay with it, I would have said so. I hope you would have done the same. Like that's the modeling that we want. No, you're right. You're putting your coach on there. I love it. (laughs) And and, no, you're absolutely right. In some ways it doesn't always feel as smooth and polished, but it's more real. Exactly. And actually, we probably get to some, I hope, and I hope it comes across, get to some answers that are more meaningful. And actually, we sh- we have something together, as opposed yeah. to one person just being on broadcast. Exactly. Person just listening. Exactly. Yeah, great felt point. Like, felt like a real conversation, which I love. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Hey, wonderful. Yeah. 
Amy, thank you for your time. Thank you for your candor and spirit. Fantastic. That was another edition of Lancefield on the Line. Thank you.